so first I would like to thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, yeah, so uh, in this talk we will be looking at two models for random surfaces, uh, random planar maps and uh, Lewell quantum gravity. Uh, so random planar map is a natural model for a discrete random surface which is studied in combinatorics, probability, uh, geometry and mathematical physics. Uh, Lewell quantum gravity uh, is a natural model for a continuum random surface um, which has its roots in uh, the physics literature. Uh, and the main result I will present uh, is a scaling limit result, which is saying that in a certain sense, um, the random planar map is converging to Lewell quantum gravity uh, when the size of, uh, of the planar map goes to uh, infinity. Um, so a planar map, it is uh, a graph drawn on the sphere uh, viewed modular continuous deformations. Um, for example, these two planar maps are considered to be the same, uh, since we can get from one to the other by continuously deforming uh, the edge in red. Uh, these two planar maps, on the other hand, are not considered to be the same. Um, so again, we can get from one to the other by moving the edge in, in red, uh, but this deformation is not considered to be uh, continuous. So um, a triangulation, it is a planar map uh, where all faces have uh, three edges. Uh, for example, the map in the left part of the figure is an example of uh, a triangulation. Uh, so if we're given some natural number n, uh, there are finite Lemmy triangulations which have exactly n vertices. Uh, and when we work, with, um, when we work with, with random planar maps, we always assume that our planar map has been chosen uniformly at random uh, from this uh, finite set of, uh, of maps. Uh, so the study of planar maps, it goes back to uh, the combinatorics literature in the 60s, uh, when Tutmullen and other, others were proving counting formulas for, for planar maps. Uh, and later they have been studied in, uh, in many different parts of both math and, and physics. Uh, for example, people realized that certain uh, matrix integrals can be ex expressed in terms of sums over uh, planar maps. Uh, uh, so in geometry, uh, people sometimes use, use planar maps to approximate continuum uh, surfaces. Uh, and in recent years, uh, there has been a huge interest among probabilists in understanding the geometry of large uh, random planar maps. Uh, so one application which is particularly uh, relevant for this talk is in mathematical physics, where, uh, where the random planar map is used, to, um, used as a model for, uh, for a random surface. Yeah, so um, yeah, I also want to show um, a simulation of a planar map. So this is a random planar map which is chosen uniform at random from the collection of planar maps which or triangulations which have uh, exactly 20,000 uh, faces. Uh, so you remember that a planar map is only defined modulo continuous deformations. Um, so there's not one unique way uh, to draw it. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm just rotating it. It's uh, yeah, I'm just yeah. Um, uh, it's the same. It's the same one. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, so there's not a unique way to draw it, but in this figure, it has been drawn in such a way where it has been attempted that all the edges ha have approximately uh, the same length. Okay, so next I want to introduce uh, Lewell quantum gravity, uh, but first I need to introduce uh, the Gaussian free field. Um, so we consider some uh, rescale version of, um, uh, of Z2 restricted to the unit square. Um, and if we have a function defined on the vertices of this graph, uh, we can define it the Hamiltonian, uh, just by considering the sum of the square differences uh, over adjacent vertices. Uh, and this Hamiltonian is minimized when um, if, if we fix the banner data, it's, it's minimized when, uh, when the function is discrete harmonic. Uh, so the discrete Gaussian free field, um, it is a function defined on the vertices of, uh, of this uh, graph, um, such that uh, the probability density uh, relative to the product of uh, Lebesgue measure is proportional to e to the power uh, minus the Hamiltonian. Uh, so in other words, the discrete Gaussian free field, uh, it is some random function defined on the vertices of this graph, where we favor functions uh, such as adjacent vertices um, uh, uh, are not uh, to having two different values, uh, or functions which are close to being uh, harmonic. Uh, so from this definition, it's possible to deduce that if we consider some fixed point of the graph and we look at the value of the function at this fixed point, then it is a normal random variable. And a normal random variable would mean zero and uh, a variance of order uh, log n. 
Uh, and there is also some covariance between different points. So the covariance between the values at Z and W um, uh, is, uh, is of order the logarithm of the inverse distance uh, between the two points. Uh, excuse me? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's exactly it's exactly Gaussian at each point. Uh, it's, an, it's exactly a normal random variable. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, so one way. What? The log just comes from the. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so one way to define the continuum Gaussian-free field is to, is, to, is to say that this is the limit of the discrete Gaussian-free field uh, when the lattice size uh, goes to zero. Uh, so if you look at the discrete Gaussian-free field, we just see that at any fixed point, uh, the variance uh, is diverging when n goes to infinity. So it's not obvious how to make sense of, um, uh, of this limiting object. Uh, and in particular, the Gaussian-free field, it is too rough and uh, irregular to be well-defined as, um, as a function. So it's not defined point-wise. But it's possible to show that the GFF, it does make sense as a random distribution or a random uh, generalized function. So it can't be evaluated point-wise, but we can, for example, integrate it against uh, test functions. Uh, so to define Liouville quantum gravity, I first assume that um, H is some smooth function defined in the unit square, uh, and that gamma is some parameter between 0 and 2. Uh, so then we, um, we can get the Riemannian manifold by rescaling the standard Euclidean metric by e to the power uh, gamma H. Um, yeah, so, uh, so Liouville quantum gravity surface is the surface we get if we let H be equal to the Gaussian free field. Uh, so since H is the distribution and not a function, it's not obvious how to make rigorous sense of this object, because it's not obvious how to define uh, e to the power uh, a distribution. Um, but it's possible to show that uh, several uh, observables of this surface uh, do make sense uh, in a rigorous way. Um, for example, it's possible to define an area measure. Uh, so the idea is that we uh, replace uh, H by some uh, regularized version, H sub epsilon, uh, we use h of epsilon to define an error measure, and we show that the resulting error measure is converging uh, as we send uh, the regularization parameter epsilon uh, to zero. Uh, it's also possible to construct a metric uh, by a similar construction. Uh, so the distance between two points is just, um, we just consider a path between the points, and we integrate uh, e to the power uh, in constant multiple of the Gaussian free field, uh, and we take the infimum overall. Uh, overall paths. That's a very recent result. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. So, what I want also want to mention is that uh, the uh, is that the, the construction of um, of the error measure is a very classical result, which goes back to the 70s and, and 80s. Uh, but the construction of uh, of the metric was done very recently and was only completed uh, earlier uh, this year. Uh, it's a much harder problem because uh, it involves uh, to optimize overall uh, overall paths. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't want to get that yeah, exactly. And I think it's actually not known exactly what it is, but I think it's just normalized by like the median or something so like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So we don't know what it is. You really can't identify it as a function of that form. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I think so. What is e what is even more important is actually that uh, that the number in. Um, uh, in the exponent is not known. So the dimension, so we, when we integrate, uh, we are dividing by... Uh, yeah, exactly. So the dimension of the space is, uh, is, uh, is not known. So the C epsilon is not the same as for normalization of the area? No. N yeah, no. No, it's not, uh, it's not the same. Uh, but what it, um, you chose, you, you're clearly using C epsilon, so the limit is non-trivial somehow. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I think, so yeah. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what are the properties that, that you, after that, convince you that that's the right scale limit? Um, right limit? Uh, yeah, so, so the way the proof, uh, the proof is going, so it, so, yeah. How do we yeah. know that this is the right answer? Uh, that this is right. Uh, so, uh, so it is, uh, so the proof is going by an axiomatic characterization. Uh, so there is some sort of reasonable approximation to the metric, which is the one you see here, which, uh, which they show tightness of. Uh, and it, that's actually, it's actually a separate group of people. So there is one group showing tightness, and there is uh, another group showing uniqueness. 
So they have a list of axioms, which, uh, and then they show uniqueness. Yeah, exactly. And then, yeah, any subsequential limit satisfies the axioms. Uh, the hard part is actually to show that um, uh, that if you assume the axioms, then you get uh, uniqueness. That yeah, that the axioms uniquely characterize the metric. The, the quantum gravity is this random metric. Is that what it means? Um, so, um, so I guess the the definition to some extent doesn't really make rigorous sense because the definition is just what I introduce in the first two bullet points. But then, but then it doesn't make rigorous sense by itself. Uh, so therefore, one just tries to look at all sorts of, we can call them observables of the surface, and we, and we try to make rigorous sense of those. And for a long time, it was only this uh, metric, no, only, only the, the, the measure which was uh, accessible. Yeah. Well, even I guess there's lots of questions about the measure itself in terms of how it's going to be to understand. Yes, um, the measure is actually a lot easier. That? Uh, yes. Um, uh, so, yeah. So one reason which makes it easier is that, yeah. No, it's um, uh, no. So it is supported on a fractal set, which depends on uh, on gamma. Uh, so yeah, I guess I say it here. Um, yeah. So it's um, yeah. So, so it doesn't have any atoms, uh, but it's uh, but it is supported on on a lower dimensional fractal. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I think, is it, uh, it two divided by gamma squared over two? It's something very simple. Yeah. Um, yeah. We can normalize so that the area is one that distances will be infinite, or if you normalize so the area is one, yeah. then distances will be infinite. No, no. So it's uh, uh, no. So. Uh, so if you consider just the setting considered here, then uh, if you, you look at it as, so the measure is going to be finite, and also the diameter of the space is also going to be finite. So um, yeah, so we consider these two models for random surfaces, planar maps and uh, an LQG. Uh, so both of these were studied by physicists in uh, in the 80s, uh, and in the physics literature, uh, the planar map is viewed as a discrete version of uh, of a Lewis quantum gravity surface. So it's implicitly assumed in in much of the literature that the planar map, in some sense, is converging to LQG when the size uh, goes to infinity. Uh, and the physicists, they use this conjectural relationship for several purposes. For example, they, they, they managed to use this to predict or calculate the dimension of several uh, random fractals and exponents of uh, statistical physics models. Uh, and many of the, of the dimensions and exponents calculated in this way were, rigorously, uh, were confirmed rigorously by mathematicians many years later using completely different methods. Um, as so, uh, so the physicists, they somehow uh, understood that these two uh, models are the same. Uh, but for, um, for mathematicians, it's been a mystery to understand their ideas uh, for at least, uh, at least 10 years. As so math mathematicians, uh, one of the first questions, um, uh, questions uh, I, I, I can ask myself is, is, what does it even mean for a planar map uh, to converge when the size goes to infinity? Uh, and there are at least three different notions of convergence that one, that one can define for a planar map. Uh, so one, uh, one way to define convergence is to say that the planar map is converging as a metric space. Uh, so a planar map is a metric space if we equip it with uh, the graph distance. So we get to some random metric space where the distance between two points is proportional to the graph distance. Uh, and convergence of planar maps in, uh, in this sense, uh, or topology, has been established for several classes of, of uniformly sampled uh, planar maps. Uh, it's also possible to say that uh, the conformal structure uh, of planar maps is converging. Uh, so this is maybe the notion of convergence, which is uh, most closely related to, uh, to the original physics papers. Uh, and the result I want to present in this talk, it is the first uh, convergence result of, of the conformal structure of, um, of a uniformly sampled uh, planar map. Um, there is also a third notion of convergence, which is given by decorating the map with some statistical physics model. 
uh, then considering certain observables of this model and then showing convergence of these observables uh, to, um, to some limiting object. Uh, so this notion of convergence has been established for planar maps uh, in, um, in several uh, universality classes, um, but, uh, but it will not be so important for the purpose of, uh, of this talk. Uh, so next I want to state, um, state the main result, which is convergence of the conformal structure. Uh, so we consider a uniformly sampled uh, triangulation, which has uh, n vertices, and, which, and, we, and in our result we also consider planar maps with a boundary, and we assume the boundary has some fixed length uh, equal to root n. Um, yeah, uh, so then we embed uh, the planar map into the equilateral triangle. Uh, so this means that we draw the planar map in some explicit way in the equilateral uh, triangle. Uh, so in the, in the left figure, the planar map is only defined modular continuous uh, deformations. But in the middle figure, we have drawn it in some explicit way in the equilateral triangle. So each vertex has a specific, uh, specific position. Um, so the particular rule we use when drawing the planar map, um, it, we call it the Cardi embedding. Uh, and I will define that more precisely in, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, yeah, but the idea is to use properties of percolation on, uh, on the planar map. Um, what do you mean that if uh, if it can be deformed? I'm trying to see where yeah. you're going to introduce some conformal structures. So yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm trying to understand the <coughs> point. The original thing was just uh, combinatorial. Yeah, exactly. Thing. Yeah. So when I put it in the triangle, it's still yeah. thought of combinatorially. Uh, no, so so then then you think of it as uh, as a surface with a conformal structure. In the triangle. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the yeah. So the is there some is this Cardi going to give me a unique way of doing it? Yeah, uh, or I guess okay. yeah. Or uh, so yeah. There is a small point that so if you uh, so it can't be unique because there are a lot of conformal maps from the triangle to itself. So oh, you need okay. to fix three right. points. Uh, yeah. So it is. Uh, yeah. So if if you give me a map, then I can tell you exactly how to draw it, and it should be in some in some conformal way. That's uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, so I will explain how we do it uh, in a few minutes. Um, yeah, so if um, so when we embed the planar map, we get some um, uh, area measure in the equilateral triangle. Uh, so the map has n vertices. We give each vertex mass one over n. Uh, yeah, uh, and that's how we define the measure. Um, use a uh, When we do um, when we embed the planar map, we also get some a random metric in the equilateral triangle, uh, and it is defined in such a way that the distance between two vertices is proportional to uh, the graph distance. Uh, so we also uh, define a measure mu and a distance function d uh, in the equilateral triangle associated with uh, a Lewell quantum gravity surface. Um, so you remember that when we defined the LQD surface, we, um, we were considering uh, a metric e to the power gamma h uh, times the standard Euclidean metric. Um, and it turns out that the particular value, uh, it turns out that um, gamma equal to the square root of h thirds, it plays a special role. Uh, and it's often called pure uh, level quantum gravity in the physics literature. Uh, so the exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so the idea is just, uh, yeah, so if, if you consider uniformly sampled planar map, then it should correspond to gamma equal to the square root of eight thirds. If you consider some other natural probability measures, resampled by some uh, statist uh, partition version of some statistical physics model, then it would give, uh, give all, the, all the values of gamma, exactly. <laughs> Where it uh, is, yeah, yeah, as yeah, um, yeah. It is actually the field which converges, which appears in our convergence world, is actually some slight variant of of the GFF. So it's not exactly the field I presented earlier, but it is essentially, uh, yeah, the field we're actually getting. Uh, then you can start with a Gaussian free field, and you add some uh, random continuous function to it. That's the exact one which appears in our in our results. Uh, yeah, but for simplicity, I'm just presenting with it with with it, with the GFF. Um, okay, so um, 
Yeah, so we can show that uh, in this setting, uh, the measure mu sub n is converting to mu, and the metric d sub n is converting to d. Uh, so in other words, we can consider some uh, coupling of a sequence of planar maps, m sub n, uh, and some Gaussian free field h, uh, such that uh, the measure mu sub n is converging weakly, and uh, the metric d sub n is converging uh, uniformly. Uh, so, the conform so when I say that we um, want to show convergence of the conformal structure, what it typically means is that we want to know, so we have some abstract surface, which is this uh, planar map, and we want to know how to embed it in the plane. Uh, and uh, so it is, um, so, so that's, so that's it. yeah, exactly. So it is, so it comes, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it comes into, so, so everything is, uh, uh, so it all depends on, on, on the definition of this Cardi embedding. Yeah, uh, that's. So the Cardi embedding is what we use to define what we call the conformal structure. Yeah. Um, yeah so, um, so I also want to state uh, a result which follows as um, as corollary of our proof. But to do that, I first need to introduce the schramm lewin revolution. Uh, so the schramm lewin revolution is a one-parameter family of random fractal curves, um, which is indexed by some parameter kappa. Uh, so SLE when kappa is equal to zero uh, is a deterministic curve. Uh, when we increase, when kappa is positive, uh, the curve is random. Uh, and when we increase the value of kappa, the curve is, is more and more uh, windy. Um, and the SLE curve is arising as the limit of statistical physics models. Uh, for example, um, uh, the model known as the Luperist random walk uh, is converting to SLE with kappa equals to two. Interfaces in the Ising model convert to SLE three and so on. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, a third example is the example of percolation. Uh, so here we consider um, percolation on the triangular lattice. Uh, so yeah, uh, the vertices are colored uniformly and independently and blue and, and yellow. Um, uh, so um, yeah, it was uh, conjectured by Eisenman at, uh, at Princeton that, that, uh, that crossing probabilities in this model should have conformally invariant uh, scaling limits. Uh, and this was uh, confirmed um, rigorously by, uh, by Smirnov uh, approximately 20 years ago. Uh, and from this, it, it was possible to prove that the percolation is converging to, uh, to an SLE. Uh, so to state the result more precisely, so we consider um, the percolation restricted to, to some simply connected domain, in this case, uh, a rectangle. We have one boundary arc which is blue, one which is yellow. Uh, and we draw the, a unique interface between blue and, uh, and yellow. Uh, and it can be, um, uh, it follows from um, uh, Smirnov's result combined with the result of Kamiya Newman that as we make the lattice finer and finer, then this curve is, uh, the interface is converging to a schramm lewin revolution uh, with parameter kappa equal to, uh, to six. Yeah, so, uh, so the schramm lewin revolution was introduced by Otto Schramm uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so Otto Schramm, he made the observation that, uh, that the models uh, which are listed here, uh, they have, uh, they have uh, at least two properties in common. Uh, so they are both, so all of them are believed to have um, scaling limits, which are uh, conformally invariant and which satisfy something known as the domain Markov property. And it proved that there is a unique one-parameter family of curves uh, which is satisfying these two properties. Uh, and, and it called these SLE curves. Um, and uh, so the introduction of SLE was a huge, um, huge uh, revolution because it uh, improved the understanding of, of the many discrete models converting to SLE. Uh, for example, because many calculations are easier to carry out in the continuum uh, than in the discrete. Exactly. Yeah, that's uh, that's yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's that's uh, an important point. Yeah, uh, yeah. So for uh, yeah, any any of these models, you need to be exactly at the critical point. So in for percolation on the triangular lattice, it happens to be that the critical point is when blue and uh, yellow are equally likely. Uh, yeah. Uh, what? You had a special number. Yeah. Is that the reason you chose that number, to be the critical situation? Uh, square root of eight thirds. No, no. no that's, uh, that's coming from, I mean, why yeah. Why is your problem it's critical? Uh, I mean, you set it up, how do I know before I start? 
so uh, so I think so that's um, so you mean the planar map why it is critical well, I guess oh. you're going to define this okay, yeah for that okay okay yeah okay um, yeah so um, yeah so first I've just restated uh, the result on the previous slide about convergence to SLE on the triangular lattice uh, so by universality, it is believed that, um, that this result also holds for percolation in many other settings. So if we have some reasonable lattice, we consider critical percolation on the lattice and draw an interface, then this should converge to an SLE6. Uh, but it turns out that, uh, and, uh, so there has been many attempts to, uh, to, add, um, to prove this result for other lattices, for example, bond percolation on, on Z2. Um, and phase percolation on the Voronoi tessellation, but, uh, but it's very difficult to prove because um, in particular Smirnov's part of the proof is using very particular combinatorial identities which are only true for the triangular lattice. Uh, but in the setting of uh, random triangulations, uh, it is possible to prove a new convergence result to address LE6. So we consider our, uh, our triangulation embedded using the Cardi embedding uh, and uh, and we um, uh, and we show that uh, and we can show that if we draw the, the interface between blue and yellow, then it converges to uh, an SLE six. So, so this is right. so this is what we can't prove on the on the square lattice, right? Exactly. Exactly. But you yeah. can prove. You're saying that you have, you have this result of sun, which yeah. proves the same the statement. Yeah. On on random on your random graph. Um, exactly. Exactly. With, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So and you and, get the universality yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you, and you give each vertex equal yellow and, and uh, Yeah, exactly. Because it turns yellow so that, yeah. Uh, I'm way behind. So okay. we have a triangle. Yeah. So we should just look at triangles because you want to use Smirnoff, is that right? Uh, so actually, so the result would actually be, you could actually choose an arbitrary simply connected domain. Uh, but All right, so yeah. there's the plane of map yeah. triangle. So where's the conformal structure? Uh, so where is the conformal structure of? You keep on saying Cardi. Yeah. 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 What is the conformal structure? Uh, so, uh, so it would just be. Uh, so it is just. Um, uh, so if you look at the limiting sur so it is just the limiting surface. It is just the standard Euclidean metric, and then reweighted by e to the power gamma h. It's a very uh, transformation. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so the cardi embedding is invariant. Yeah, uh, yeah, the cardi embedding is invariant on a conformal transformation. So when I say convergence, uh, so when I say convergence of the conformal structure, is it, I mean, so, I, so what we mean when we when we talk about that is it's rather that we we have a planar map and we want some sort of canonical way to embed it in the equilateral triangle, and we want to show that the that the resulting object is converging. Uh, that yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I still haven't said how uh, <laughs> how the embedding is. Yeah. Uh, but that's the statement. That I, I know we can't prove it on the square lattice. That's been yeah. For a long time. Now. Yeah. We all did it on triangular. Yeah. And it's still open. Right? But, but yeah. On, on, the, on, the on, the, on the random one, it is possible. It is possible to do it. So the planar map has a lot of very nice properties. Uh, yeah. So if uh, it has a lot of like Markov properties, so if you explore. Uh, when you explore to if you ex have started exploring towards inter along an interface, if you are in a lattice, then then the future is completely distorted. If you do the same thing on the planar map, then then there are some nice Markov properties. So you sort of always see the same sort of environment. If you condition on the path, the future is always going to be the same. So that's uh, yeah, th those sort of properties make the this random lattice much easier to to work with. Yeah, there are also some yeah, of course, some other ingredients as well, but that's one of the reasons it is here. Uh, yeah, so uh, so this is convergence, which is in um, a quenched sense. Um, so that's a stronger notion of convergence than uh, annealed convergence. Uh, so to explain the difference between uh, the two, so one one thing we can do is to we consider uh, a planar map uh, M sub n. We consider two independent percolations P n one and p and 2. Uh, so this is going to give us uh, two independent interfaces, p, or not, not two independent, it's going to give us two interfaces, p and 1, no, a, eta and 1, and eta uh, and 2. So we have these two independent percolations, which each give rise to each, uh, to one interface each. Uh, so annealed convergence, uh, 
uh, it means that if we consider one of these interfaces, for example, the first one, uh, then it converges to an SLE6. Uh, while quenched, it means that if we consider the joint law of these two uh, interfaces, uh, then they converge to, uh, to two uh, SLE curves. Uh, such that these two SLE curves are independent of each other. So annual convergence means that the marginal law of one curve is converging. Quence con convergence means that, um, that the joint law of two cu curves is converging. So at first, when you first see this, maybe it seems obvious that the quench follows from the annealed, but it's not obvious because um, uh, if, you look, uh, if you look at, you remember that these two percolations are independent, but these two interfaces are actually not going to be independent because the randomness is also depending on uh, the randomness of these curves is also depending on the randomness of the planet map. So we need to show that that randomness is disappearing in, uh, in the limit. Uh, so yes, I can mention that, uh, that there is also an annealed version of, of, of the result I've stated here, which was early approved by Gwyn and, and Miller. Uh, so the difference between our result is that it is annealed and also that they didn't consider an embedding. So they considered some abstract metric space and they viewed this, the curve as a curve on the abstract uh, metric space. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it is, um, uh, yeah, so if you have, um, if you want to show convergence of, um, uh, for as, as a metric space, then it's the gromo hausdorff topology. Uh, then it's also possible to consider if you have a metric space with a curve, which is what you would get here, there is a uh, natural variant uh, of that topology. Um, so that's the one which is considered. Okay, so there's also a loop version of this result. Uh, so the conformal loop ensemble, it is the loop version of SLE6. So an instance of the conformal loop ensemble, it is a countable collection of, of loops, uh, which look locally like uh, SLE6 curves. Uh, so on the triangular lattice, um, the full collection of percolation interfaces converges to CLE6 in the limit. And again, we have the same, uh, the same result on, uh, uh, on the triangular, now on, on, on this cardi embedded uh, triangulation. Okay, um, so we also have some convergence of, uh, of crossing probabilities. Um, so we consider um, a uniformly sampled planet map uh, and we choose uh, four boundary points, A, B, C, D, uniformly at random. Uh, so then we can um, consider, uh, we can put percolation on the map and we can, <coughs> can consider the probability that there is a blue crossing which is connecting the arc A, B and the arc C, D. Uh, so this is uh, a probability where we average over the randomness of the planar map and we condition on the planar map itself with these four marked points. Uh, so P sub n, it is, some, uh, it is some random variable which is a function of, of this planar map with the marked points. Uh, and then we can show that this uh, random variable P sub n is converging uh, in law when n goes to infinity. Yeah, so uh, one reason this is interesting is that, um, so, um, so in conformal geometry, there is something called extremal distance, and this piece of band can be used to define some notion of extremal distance between the boundary arcs, A, B, and, uh, and C, D. Uh, so the extremal distance is saying something about conformal properties of, uh, of the surface. Um, so this, this result, it gives some first hint uh, that, that, there should, uh, that, uh, that we have convergence of the conformal structure of, of the surface. Um, so in some sense, it is a weaker result than the, than the result I stated before, um, but it's also a much simpler and easier to state result because it doesn't depend on any embedding. It's only, we only consider this single, uh, single real, uh, real number. In this case, uh, wouldn't need to know? You, the cardi embedding, you mean, yeah. The cardi embedding. Exactly. Would, <laughs> you would be taking Yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah, yeah, so that's something, yeah. These crossing probabilities will not be the same as they are for planets, right? Um, or in the, or the square lash or a triangular lens, they'll be different. Uh, the for crossing probabilities on, on a square lattice or on a, on a hexagonal lens. Yeah. Is, they won't be the same. They're probably related to, to the point of control. 
uh, as you mean the crossing probabilities yeah. on the different lattices it should be so in so in the limit they are the same are yeah the same. yeah okay. uh, so they are the same in the sense um, in the sense that if you, yeah yeah so if you if you take this this object and you just embed it using this cardi embedding for example then yes. because so far you just have crossing probabilities on this uh, with these four marked points a b c d and you don't know where they are I mean they don't, but if you fix the, the position of A, B, C, D uh, under the embedding, uh, then it should, uh, then the crossing probability, uh, it's, it's just as on, um, on the triangular lattice. Um, okay, so uh, so now I will define uh, the Cardi embedding. <laughs> By the way, this is Cardi yeah. embedding was before the uh, the cardi embedding. Uh, so, um, uh, so on the on the one hand, it was something that we made for our for our work. Um, but then, um, but then, so it has so so one way to state Smirnov's result. Uh, it is that if he if he considers a triangular lattice and he restrict it to some uh, to some nice domain. So we just consider the triangle lattice, and we just, yeah, and we imagine it's restricted to some domain, uh, and then we do, so then we get some, we just restrict to the domain, and we get the graph, and then we do the Cardi embedding of that graph. Uh, so he could prove that uh, if you look at the conformal map, which is defined by the Cardi embedding, then that is approximating uh, the conformal map between these domains. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ah, Cardi. Okay. Uh, yeah. So um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So there was uh, there was originally a conjecture that there should be conformal invariant the crossing probabilities, and he was deriving an explicit formula for it. Okay. Yeah. So first came the conjecture of conformal invariant, yeah. and then he computed the cross ratios. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, and then it was yeah proved. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so as I also mentioned earlier, so in order, to, so we want to define a conformal map uh, from the planar map to the equilateral triangle, and uh, in order for this to be uniquely defined, we first need to specify to fix the position of, of three points. We just choose the three points: little a, little b, little c, uniformly at random from the boundary. Uh, so now we have uh, fixed. Uh, so we know where we want to send little a, little b, little c, and we choose some arbitrary or other vertex v. Uh, and we ask uh, to which point should this vertex v uh, be sent. Uh, so the idea of the approach is to use uh, crossing probabilities. Um, so uh, we have, uh, we consider here percolation on the triangular lattice, we have some point x, uh, and we're interested in the event that there is a crossing um, in blue separating a, a, a nx from b and c. Uh, so it follows from Smirnov's result that if the position of x is fixed and we send the lattice size to zero, then this probability is converging to a constant, uh, which is a function of x and which we denote by p sub a of, uh, of x. Uh, so then we can consider the exact same, um, the exact same uh, probability on the planar map. So we have our vertex v, uh, and we're interested in the probability that there is a percolation crossing uh, separating a and v from, from b and c. Uh, and we denote it by p hat sub a of v. Uh, and we define, define p, uh, p sub b and p sub c in a similar way. And then when, when we embed um, the planar map, then we send the vertex v to the point x of the equilateral triangle so that the triple associated with x is equal to the triple associated with, with b. Yeah. OK. Uh, yeah, any questions to this before I, I continue? OK. Um, yeah, so, um, so we have proved, uh, proved our result for the case of uniformly sampled triangulations and for this cardi embedding. But the result is believed to hold in a much bigger uh, generality. Uh, so instead of considering the cardi embedding, there are also a number of other conformal embeddings uh, that one can consider. Um, and I will come back to those um, in a minute. 
Uh, it's also possible to consider maps with other local constraints. So instead of considering triangulations, one can consider quadrangulations, general maps, and so on. And by universality, it is believed that uh, these lo different local constraints, they don't, uh, they don't matter in, um, uh, th that the local constraint, uh, they don't matter in, uh, in the limit. So the difference yeah. in yeah. the Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, exactly. So if you do one of the modifications described in one or two, the limiting object should be the same. Uh, but on the other hand, if you do, um, if you consider the, the change, yeah, exactly. So in, in the third bullet point, uh, so what we're doing then, we are um, not considering uniformly sampled planar maps. Uh, but we're typically, yeah, typically considering some statistical physics model and then uh, reweight. So the, so the probability of sampling a certain map is proportional to the partition function of that model on, on the planar map. And uh, in, uh, in this case, it is believed that the limiting object, um, it is gamma level quantum gravity, where gamma depends on, on the model. So I will uh, show you a few examples of the other uh, embeddings. So one possibility is to use a circle packing. Uh, so, um, so circle packing is such that each uh, vertex is associated with a circle. Uh, and uh, two uh, vertices are adjacent if and, if and only if the corresponding circles are tangent. Um, yeah, so if for large class of planar maps, one can show that there always exists a circle packing. And for the case of triangulations, it's al also unique uh, modulo, um, so uh, modulo Möbius transformations. Um, so uh, another possibility is to consider um, is to use Riemannian uniformization. So if we have a planar map, we can view it as a Riemannian manifold. For example, if we have a tri a triangulation, we can uh, give each face the metric of the standard equilateral triangle. Uh, so we have a collection of standard equilateral triangles, and we glue them together in order to create to create a manifold. So this is going to be smooth, except uh, possibly some conical singularities where at, at the vertices. Uh, so then there, there is the uniformization theorem, which is the generalization of the Riemann mapping theorem, uh, saying that if we have some simply connected Riemann surface, then there exists a control map uh, from this surface to either the unit disk, the complex plane, or, or the sphere. Uh, so by using this result, uh, we know that there exists some control map uh, from our, which takes our planar map and to one of these uh, three domains. Uh, so it's also possible to use uh, the tut embedding. Um, so the tut embedding is defined such that um, the location of each interior vertex is equal to the average of the location of the adjacent vertices. Um, and if the boundary data are fixed, then the tut embedding exists and, and is unique. Um, so for each of these four embeddings, it's possible to argue at least uh, heuristically why this embedding should approximate a conformal map. Um, and um, and as, as I also mentioned earlier, so it is believed uh, that, um, that in the limit, uh, so which embedding we use shouldn't matter. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, so if we have a planar map, we embed it using two of these uh, embeddings, then it's, it is believed that each vertex is mapped to the same location, to approximate the same location uniformly over all, uh, all the vertices. Uh, but there are few or no rigorous relationships between these embeddings. Um, uh, and uh, there has been uh, many works which have studied the first three embeddings, uh, but it turns out they are, that they are very different to, to analyze. Um, so for example, one necessary condition to get convergence is, there are, it, is that there are no macroscopic phases in, uh, in the limit. So if we, for example, look at this picture, we, we need that there are no macroscopic circles um, as the number of vertices goes to infinity. But even such a seemingly basic result has turned out to be very challenging to prove. Uh, for, so yeah. uh, that there are no macroscopic phases, exactly. Uh, so it just means that so you, you can sample a uniformly sampled planar map you can, with n vertices. You can embed it with using the circle packing. And then you can look at what is the biggest circle in circle packing. Uh, and then you expect that when the number of vertices of the map goes to infinity, then, uh, then the size of the biggest circle should go to zero. Uh, but it turns out that these sort of properties are, uh, are very hard to establish uh, uh, rigorously for uh, for the first three embeddings. But 
Ah, uh, yeah, and that's yeah, uh, yeah. So it's true that um, so so it's true that of course the circle packing is not unique. Uh, so what one typically typically does is uh, so for example you sample three uniform vertices and you require that these are mapped to three fixed locations, okay. uh, and that so should that should avoid exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so it should. Um, yeah, so that's how. Uh, yeah, because of course you're uh, right that you can always. Um, yeah, well, you can always expand one SQL and be exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> uh, okay. So uh, in the remaining time, I want to say a few words about how how we prove this uh, result. Um, how we prove convergence of uh, uh, that the Cardi embedded uh, map is converging to LQG. Uh, so it's uh, proved in collaboration with Shin Sun, uh, but it's also based on uh, on the series of works, which also involve uh, a number of other people, which you can see, yeah, see on this slide. So yeah, I guess I can also say that yeah, the, the remaining slides they don't cover all of these works, but they cover yeah, I guess they cover four, five, yeah, four, five, and six roughly. Um, okay, so yeah, I'll just go as far as I uh, as far as I get in the remaining time. Um, yeah, so we consider uh, our uniformly sample triangulation. Um, and then, uh, as we've seen before, this defines um, this defines a random metric space, and it also defines a random metric measure space. Uh, so it defines a random metric measure space if we give each vertex mass one over n, and if we um, uh, consider the graph metric, rescaled such that adjacent vertices have distance n to the power of minus uh, a quarter. Um, yeah. So um, uh, so then we can. Uh, yeah, we can let um, let uh, so we can let S be, for example, uh, the set of metric mesh spaces. So it's just a space of compact uh, metric mesh spaces with a metric and, and a measure and. Uh, there is a natural distance function that one can define on uh, on this set. Uh, so this is uh, the Grom of uh, hazard Broker of distance, um, and in particular, if you have uh, so the distance between two metric mesh spaces is zero if and only if uh, there is um, a measure preserving isometry between the two spaces. But um, and in general, I will not give a precise definition. But in general, it measures how much you need to distort one space in order to get to get the other one. Uh, yeah. um, okay, so um, so we can show that if we consider this planar map, uniformly sampled planar map, then it converges as uh, as a metric mesh space for this uh, GHP topology uh, to some limit. Um, so you remember that if we have a Lewell quantum gravity surface, then it has a metric and it has a measure. So it defines a metric mesh space, and this metric mesh space is exactly the limit of. Um, of uh, of this uh, uniformly sampled uh, planar map. Uh, so there are many results uh, of a similar spirit um, in earlier literature. Uh, Lugal and Mirmont were the first to prove convergence results of this kind. Uh, so they considered the case of um, uniformly sampled quadrangulations uh, with sphere topology. Uh, yeah, so quadrangulation is the case where all faces have three have, have four uh, four edges. Um, then there was a the work of Bettinelli and Mirmont where they considered the case of quadrangulations with, uh, with the topology of the disk. Um, so all of these three works were based on, uh, on bijections between the planar maps they considered and some simpler objects. Um, so what, for example, there is a bijection between quadrangulations with sphere topology and what is called labeled trees. So labeled tree is just, uh, it's just a tree uh, where we put labels, um, labels on the vertices, and we put labels. We require that adjacent labels are differing by at most one. Uh, and in in this projection, there is um, there is also projection uh, modulo a special vertex. There is also projection between the vertices of this uh, tree and the vertices of the map. 
And it turns out that the labels in the tree is encoding distances in the map. Uh, and therefore, it's possible to prove, uh, by using this, it's possible to prove convergence uh, of the map in this GHP uh, topology um, simply by analyzing this tree, which is a much simpler object. So uh, so yeah. One, one between yeah. The, between the trees with, with the labels. labels, yeah. And, and uh, planar, planar maps. Uh, and uh, so it, it's only quadrangulations. Quadrangulations. Yeah. Uh, so this is called yeah, sometimes Schaefer projection and sometimes CVS projection. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, so our proof is also based on on a projection of in a similar spirit. So instead of considering this kind of object, what we consider is uh, what we call uh, blossoming forests. So blossoming forest is just yeah a collection of trees. Um, such that each, if you look at except the root, then we want each vertex to have what we call blossoms, which is like two, yeah, two things like this that uh, are decorated by these blossoms. Yeah. Uh, and again, so in our case, it is these uh, blossoms which are somehow encoding distances nicely in uh, in the map uh, via this uh, bijection. Uh, so this projection we use is based on Paul Alhan and uh, and Schaefer, uh, yeah, uh, and it has also been used uh, closely related projection has also been used in some previous uh, previous convergence results for planar maps. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so this is just a restatement of the earlier result. Um, so now we let p sub n be a uniform percolation on the planar map. Uh, so we color, um, uh, yeah, we assume the boundary is blue and otherwise uh, we color the vertices uniform at random in, in blue and, uh, and yellow. Uh, um, yeah, so then, um, uh, so, uh, so this object, um, and we draw the percolation cycle, so the object we get, this is now going to be a, measure me a metric measure space decorated by a collection of loops. Uh, so a loop is simply just a continuous map. Uh, from from the circle and to uh, and to our uh, our space, uh, and there is a, a natural variant of the gromov hausdorff prokhorov topology, which is called uh, this gromov hausdorff prokhorov uniform topology, uh, which is for metric mesh spaces with decorated by loops. So roughly speaking, we're acquiring that the loops to objects are close if the loops are staying uniformly close. Um, so we can also prove that this map decorated with percolation. Uh, it is converging in this GHPU topology. Um, and uh, if we look at the limiting object, uh, then it can be described as this LQD surface as before, but then now decorated with a, with a collection of loops. Uh, and uh, this collection of, of loops, they have the law of this conformal loop ensemble that we saw before. And this conformal loop ensemble, it, is, it turns out that it is completely independent of the LQD surface. So we just, the limiting object can be defined just by having an LQD surface and drawing a collection of independent CLE loops on, uh, on top of it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so on one hand, this, this convergence result is, it, it is a rather strong result in itself because it gives convergence of the metric, uh, it gives convergence of the map as a metric mesh space and also in some sense the behavior when decorated by percolation is converging. Uh, but it doesn't say anything about the conformal properties of, of the surface. Um, because this GHPU topology is only treating our object as some abstract metric mesh spaces with decorations, it doesn't say anything about embedding into, into the plane. Uh, so the main trick we use to um, also get convergence of, or the main tool we use to get convergence of the conformal uh, properties, it is dynamical percolation. Uh, so this is dynamical percolation on uh, the faces of the hexagonal lattice. Um, so each uh, vertex has an independent clock which is ringing at random times and every time the clock is ringing then the color is, is resampled. And the distance, be uh, the time between two clock rings are independent exponentials. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Do you use this? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the idea, so that's what I will explain uh, on the next slide. So the idea is just that we, uh, so we, uh, so in our setting it's natural to consider this dynamics on the planar map. Uh, so we consider this uh, dynamical percolation on the planar map, which gives us some 
dynamically changing collection of loops as we call it, recolor the vertices. Sorry, this was every second uh, was exponential. Yeah, so it's, uh, so it's just that, e yeah. So the, these loops will change. Exactly, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so we have our, now our metric mesh space with some dynamically evolving, the dynam dynamically changing collection of loops. Yeah. And you have the scaling. Uh, and yeah, exactly. And we have the scaling limit. So so it's um, yeah. So we can uh, so what one can um, what one can prove is that so we know that at each fixed time we know what the law is. At each fixed time is just going to be the exact same as at time zero. Um, so we know that uh, that object uh, is converging to the LQG surface with a CLE. Uh, so we, could, we can strengthen this result to saying that, um, that the whole process uh, is converging to, um, to some dynamically changing CLE. So we have a fixed LQG surface, we have some CLE on top of it, which is dynamically changing. Uh, and we call this process Leoville dynamical percolation. Uh, so this is a process where these CLE loops are merging and splitting. Uh, so for example, so this is just two of the CLE loops at some fixed point in time. Uh, then maybe we decide that the leftmost loop, so I've just colored one in gray and one in blue, we decide that at some point in time we want to split the leftmost loop into two loops. So yeah, we get this, uh, now we get a collection of three loops. At some later point in time, we decide to merge this collection of loops at this point. So we go back to having two loops, and so on. Uh, so this is, um, yeah, so this process we call it Leoville dynamical percolation. Yeah. Did something like this already exist if you didn't have the underlying graph be a random Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so something rather similar to this has been done on the triangular lattice. Uh, so there is a series of works by Garban, Peta, and Schramm where they do where they construct uh, this similar kind of process um, as the scaling limit of dynamical percolation on the triangular lattice. Okay. Yeah. It, it yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, so it's a similar, I mean, it's a similar spirit. It is different, the limiting process is different uh, because we have the LQG surface and if you look at the rate at which the different points are resampled, then that depends on the background surface. Um, yeah, but they are, uh, the processes are, are, are still closely related. Um, it's, it's basically just the intensity at, at which different points are resampled, which is different in, in our case and in the other case. But it's a random intensity which is varying in space based on the... Based on the background, uh, exactly. So if the GFF is very large in certain regions, then the updates are going to happen a lot faster. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so this Leeuwald dynamical percolation, this is, um, this is a stationary process. Uh, and one of the most uh, fundamental questions we can ask is whether it is ergodic. Uh, and we prove that it is mixing, which is in particular implies that it is ergodic. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so heuristically, just that um, uh, as time goes to infinity, the, the CLE becomes asymptotically independent as it's in, uh, independent of the initial state. So to be more precise, we can consider two arbitrary events, E1 and E2, which depends on the percolation, you know, which depends on the CLE. Uh, and we can show that the covariance between that event happening at time zero and at time t, so an e E1 at time zero and E2 at time t, uh, is going to, to zero as t goes to infinity. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this, I can also mention that this is based on, the proof is based on discrete Fourier analysis techniques, and it's also inspired by uh, by this work where they studied it on the triangular lattice. Uh, so, so they proved somewhat weaker result because they required E1 to be equal to E2 and so on. And they only considered a certain set of events, E1 and E2, but it's, it, yeah, the, our proof is, uh, is, is, is using some techniques, they're using many techniques from, from that work. Um, yeah, um, okay, so, so one reason this result is interesting is because it says how sensitive the percolation model is to changes. Uh, so you see that when we took a scaling limit, then I was rescaling tai by n to the power minus a quarter. So it means that a unit time for the limiting process corresponds to time n to the power minus a quarter for the discrete process. 
Um, so it means that at time big C for the limiting process, then the fraction of vertices, which has been changing color at least once, is C times n to the power minus uh, a quarter. Uh, and from the mixing result, it's possible to deduce that if we have some um, uh, planar map with percolation, and then we resample this tiny fraction of vertices. We only resample fraction c to the power c times n to the power minus a quarter fraction of the vertices. Uh, then this uh, then it follows from the mixing result that um, that the limiting that the limiting CLE we get is actually going to be independent of the original one. Yeah, it's going to be independent in the limit as c goes to infinity. Uh, yeah. Uh, so one corollary is that if we have a planar map with two percolations, and uh, then th we get two independent CLEs in, in the limit. And from this one can deduce the, the convergence under the cardia embedding uh, by some uh, law of large number argument. Um, okay. So I think that, yeah, that was all I wanted to say. <laughs>